We are going to talk about the network architecture. We start from discussing the design of the network architecture. The first variance of the network architecture I want to talk about is convolutional neural network. Its abbreviation is CNN. The CNN is used especially for processing images. I hope that through this example of CNN, you can understand the network architecture and the insight behind the design. Why design the network architecture? Can it make our network perform better? Okay, the next example we are going to talk about is related to images. Imagine that we have to classify images. That is, give the machine an image and let the machine decide what kind of things are in this image. How to do it? We have already told you how to do classification. In the following discussion, we assume that the size of the input image of our model is fixed. For example, we fix the size of the input image to 100 multiplied by 100. We assume that all images have the same size. It is a common assumption today. When doing image recognition, even if deep learning is so popular today, we still need to assume that the sizes of input images for a model are the same. You may wonder that there are bigger or smaller images, and not all images are square. What if the input is a rectangular image? Here is the common processing method. The processing method is to rescale all images to the same size before using it as the input of the image recognition system. What should the output of our model be? The goal of our model is classification. So, we will express each category as a one hot vector. Our goal is called Y head. In this one hot vector, supposed for the category of cat, the value of the corresponding dimension to the cat is 1. The value of the other dimensions are 0. The length of this dimension can determine the number of different objects that your model can recognize. If the length of your vector is 2000, it means your model can identify 2000 different objects. Typically, a strong image recognition system can identify more than 1000 objects or up to tens of thousands of different objects. If you want your image recognition system can identify tens of thousands of objects, then your label will be a one hot vector with tens of thousands of dimensions. After a softmax layer, the output is denoted as Y prime. We hope the cross entropy between Y prime and Y head is as small as possible. We have already talked about cross entropy, so I believe there's no problem with that. The next question is how to use an image as an input to a model. Let's take a look at what is an image for the computer. For a machine, an image is a three dimensional tensor. What is a tensor? If you don't know what tensor is, you just think of it as a matrix with the dimension greater than 2. The dimension of the matrix is 2. The one whose dimension is more than 2 is called tensor. An image is a three dimensional tensor. What three dimensions are? One is the width of the image. Another one is the height of the image. And the other is the number of channels. What do the channels mean? There are a lot of pixels in a colorful image, and they are composed of three colors of RGB. These three channels represent the three colors of RGB. The length and the width represent the resolution of the image, and they determine the total number of pixels in this image. Then, we will straighten this three dimensional tensor. After straightening, we can use it as the input of the network. So far, the input of the network we have talked about is a vector. As long as we can turn an image into a vector, we can use it as the input of the network. How to turn this three-dimensional tensor into a vector? The most intuitive way is to straighten it. How many numbers are there in a three-dimensional tensor? There are 100 multiplied by 100 multiplied by three numbers in this example. So an image is composed of 100 multiplied by 100 multiplied by three numbers. Take these numbers out and arrange them in a row. Then we can get the huge vector. This vector can be used as the input of the network. In this vector, the value stored in each dimension is a pixel. And it is the intensity of a certain color. Each pixel is composed of three colors, namely RGB. Each color has a numerical value that represents the intensity of the color. In this vector, the value of each dimension represents the intensity of a certain color at a certain position. For this vector, we can think of it as an input of a network. So far, we only talked about fully connected network. 
if we use the vector as the input of the network, the length of the feature vector is 100 multiplied by 100 multiplied by 3. It is a very long vector. Let's suppose that our model has 1000 neurons in the first layer. Can you calculate the number of weights? In the first layer, each neuron comes with a weight corresponds to each value in the input vector. So, if the input shape of vector is 100 times 100 times 3, and there are 1000 neurons, then the number of weight we now have of the first layer is 1000 times 100 times 100 times 3, which is 3 times 10 to the power of 7. It is a very large number. What kind of problems with a huge number of parameters? Although with the increase of parameters, we can increase the flexibility of the model and we can also increase its capabilities. But, we increase the risk of overfitting at the same time. About the flexibility of the model, and how the overfitting happened. Teacher Wu, Pei Yuan will, mathematically, give everyone a very clear proof next week. Here, we only talk about it conceptually. The more flexible the model is, the more possible it is to overfit. How should we do to reduce so many parameters? When doing image recognition, Considering the characteristics of image recognition problem, we don't need fully connected network actually. Considering the characteristics of image itself, we don't need every neurons actually. There is a weight with each input dimension. In other words, the followings are some observations of the characteristics of the image recognition problem. The first observation is that for the problem of image recognition, suppose we want to know if there is an animal in this picture say, a bird. For an image recognition system, the neuron that recognizes the object, or the neural network that recognizes an image, has to detect whether, in this picture, there are any important patterns, which represent some kind of patterns of the objects. For example, a certain neuron said, I saw the pattern of the beak. And another neuron said, I saw the pattern of the eyes. And another neuron said, I saw the pattern of bird claws. Maybe, combining them together, it means that we saw a bird. A neural network can tell you, because I saw these patterns, so I saw a bird. You may say, looking at patterns and deciding what it is, seems not so smart. But, if you think deeper about it, you will realize that people also use the same method to judge whether there is a bird in a picture. For example, I'm not sure if you have seen animals here. You see, there is a beak here. There is an eye here. It looks like a crow. But, it is actually a cat. If you think it is a bird, then you should put down the wine glass. Because it is a cat. So, even if it is a human, while judging an object, he often catches the most important features. By seeing these characteristics, you will feel that, very intuitively, you saw something. For the machine, maybe it is also an effective way to judge what objects are in the image. But, suppose what we are doing with neurons, is to judge whether there are any patterns appearing. Maybe we don't need every neurons, to see a complete picture. Because for these important patterns, like beak, eyes and bird's claws, we don't need to look the whole picture, to get the information. If you want to know whether there is a beak, you only need to look at a small area, actually. You don't need to look at the whole picture. So, maybe, we don't necessarily needs that much neurons that take the whole picture as input. They only need to take a small part of the picture as input, which is enough for them to detect whether there exists some critical patterns. This is the first observation. Based on this observation, we can do the first simplification. How do we simplify it? Originally, each of our neuron needs to see through the complete picture. In the picture, we put each pixel, which has three numbers, and all information to a neuron, to make it confused. This is what fully connected network does. But, now we have observed that. Maybe we don't need to let a neuron see the complete picture. We only need to let it look at a small part of the picture. Then, through this observation, how do we design our neural network? There is an approach in CNN. We will set an area called receptive field. Every neuron only cares about the things happening in its own receptive field. For example, you will first define this blue neuron that it is responsible for this receptive field. Then, there are 3 times 3 times 3 values in this receptive field. Okay, there are 3 times 3 times 3 values in the small cube. 
for the blue neuron, it only needs to care about this small area. And not to care about what's in the whole picture. It only cares about the things happening in its own receptive field. Then, how does this neuron know in its receptive field? Anything happens? What it has to do is to straighten the value of 3 times 3 times 3 to become a vector with a length of 3 times 3 times 3, which is 27 dimension. Then, we use these 27 dimensional vectors as the input of this neuron. This neuron will assign a weight to each dimension of the 27 dimensional vector. So this neuron has 27 weights. With the bias and the weights, this neuron can output a new vector, which is used as the input of the neuron of the next layer. For every neuron, it only considers its own receptive field. How can we define this receptive field? Maybe you have to ask yourself. For instance, here is a blue neuron, which just cover the range in the upper left corner. And this is its receptive field. Here is another yellow neuron, which covers the 3 times 3 times 3 area in the lower right corner. I can't draw this three-dimensional figure. I draw a square here to represent the range of 3 times 3 times 3. This is the receptive field of the yellow neuron. Note that the receptive fields can also overlap. For example, I draw a receptive field now. This part is the receptive field of the green neuron. There is some overlap between the blue one and the yellow one. This is also fine. Receptive fields can overlap with each other. You can say that the receptive field of the two neurons overlaps with each other. Then you can even use two different neurons to cover the same range. Maybe using a single neuron is not sufficient to detect all critical patterns. There can be multiple neurons in the same range. We can use several neurons with the same receptive field. Then you might have some new ideas. For example, can we have receptive fields with different sizes? Because the sizes of patterns are not fixed. Some patterns can be detected with a 3 times 3 receptive field. Some may need a 11 times 11 receptive field to be detected successfully. Can we have receptive fields with different sizes? This is actually a common trick. Or, can we make receptive fields only consider certain channels? Here, it seems that the receptive field considers three channels, RGB. But maybe some patterns only appear in the red channel. Maybe some patterns only appear in the blue channel. Can I have some neurons only consider one channel? Yes, I will talk about that in the chapter of network compression in the future. For general CNN, we seldom use this, but you can still do that. Someone might note that the receptive fields here are all square. The previous examples, 3 times 3 and 11 times 11, are also square. Can it be rectangular? Of course. It all depends on you. Receptive field is designed by you. You can decide the shape and the size of the receptive fields based on the problem you want to address. There may be some kinds of weird ideas you might want to make. The receptive fields not be adjacent? Can we design a neuron with the receptive field only cover the upper left corner and the bottom right corner of the image? It's possible theoretically, but you have to think about why you want to do this. Will there be any pattern that can only be detected in this manner? If not, this kind of receptive field is useless. The reason why the receptive fields are adjacent is because we think that a specific pattern will appear adjacently with the picture when we do the detection. It will not appear at many different places in the picture. And therefore, the receptive field is usually adjacent. But if you want to design a very weird receptive field to solve some special problems, that's still fine. It's all up to you. Although we can design the receptive field arbitrarily. Here I want to tell everyone the most classic receptive field. What is the most classic receptive field? The first one is covering all channels. Generally, for image recognition, we don't think. Some patterns only appear in a certain channel. Consequently, we will make the receptive field cover all channels. Since the receptive field will cover all channels, we only need to point out the height and the width. When we describe the receptive field, we don't need to talk about its depth. Anyway, the depth must consider all channels. The height and the width of the receptive field together is called the kernel size. In this example, the kernel size is 3 times 3. In general, our kernel size will not be too large. A 3 times 3 kernel is usually enough for image recognition. 
A kernel with 7 times 7 9 times 9 is quite big. Usually we do 3 times 3. You may ask, if the kernel size is all 3 times 3, does it means that we think all the important patterns are only in the small range of 3 times 3? In image recognition, it sounds weird. Some patterns may be very big. Maybe the 3 times 3 kernel cannot detect them. We will answer this question later. For now, I will just tell you that the usual way to set up receptive fields is to use a 3 by 3 kernel size. Generally, a receptive field will have a group of neurons to look after it. So after you draw a receptive field, there won't be just one neuron to take care of it. There won't be just one neuron to process this receptive field. Instead, there will be a group of neurons, maybe 64 or 128 neurons, to look after the receptive field. Okay, so far we only talked about one receptive field. What is the relationship? Between different receptive fields, you will take the receptive field in the upper left corner and shift it to the right a little bit to create a new region to look after. Creating another receptive field, the amount of movement is called stride. In this example, the stride is equal to 2. Stride is a hyperparameter decided by you. You have to adjust the hyperparameter yourself, but you often won't set it to be too large. Usually, 1 or 2 is enough because you want the receptive fields to overlap with other receptive fields. Why do we want receptive fields to overlap? Because if receptive fields do not overlap at all, and a pattern appears exactly at the junction of the two receptive fields, then there will not be any neuron to detect it, and you might miss this pattern. So we hope that the receptive fields can have a high degree of overlapping. Suppose we set stride to 2. The first receptive field is here. Then the second one will be here. For the third one, we shift two more spaces to the right. We shift two more spaces to the right and place the third one right here. Here comes the problem. What should I do if it exceeds the scope of the image? Someone might say, don't put a receptive field here. But you will miss the edge if you do that. If there is a pattern on the fringe of the image, you won't have neurons to take care of those patterns. There will not be any neurons to detect the patterns on the fringe. So usually we will have to consider the fringe. But what should I do if it is outside the image? If it's outside the image, do some padding. What is padding? Padding is to add zeros. Okay, so if you have a part of the receptive field that exceeds the fringe of the image, then treat it as if the values there are all zero. In fact, there are other ways to do padding. Padding only means to fill values. And there are other ways to do it. For example, someone would say, I don't want to add zeros here. I will pad with the average of all values in the image. Yes, you can. Or you would say, I will take out these numbers on the fringe and use it to pad. Where there are no values. Sure, there are a variety of different padding methods. Okay, on the other hand, except for shifting horizontally, you will also shift vertically. You will have this vertical movement. Here, we also set the vertical stride to 2. So you have a receptive field here. Shift two spaces vertically, and place a receptive field here. You follow this method and scan the entire image. So in this whole image, every part is covered by a certain receptive field. That is, for every position in the image, there are a group of neurons detecting whether certain patterns exist. Okay, so this is the first approach to simplify a fully connected network. What's the second observation? The second observation is that the same pattern may appear in different regions of the image. For example, the pattern of the beak. It may appear in the upper left corner of the image, or in the middle of the image. Although they all have the same shape, say, they are all beaks. They may appear in different parts of the picture. According to what we just discussed, having the same pattern appearing at different places doesn't seem to be a big problem because the beak in the upper left corner must fall in a certain receptive field. Since receptive fields cover the entire image, so there are no places in the picture that are not located within a certain neuron's responsible region. So these places must be located within a neuron's receptive field. Suppose in this receptive field, there is a neuron whose job is to detect the beak. The beak will be detected. Okay, so even if the beak appears in the middle, it doesn't matter, 
it must locate in a certain receptive field and in that receptive field there must be a group of neurons taking care of the region suppose there exists a neuron that can detect the beak the beak appearing in the middle of the image will also be detected but the problem here is that these neurons that detect beaks are doing exactly the same thing the only difference is the location since what they do are the same and only their responsible locations are different. Do we really need to put a neuron that detects beaks at every receptive field? What they do is fundamentally the same. Only their responsible regions are different. If we have neurons that detects beaks in every receptive field, don't you think it have too many parameters? This concept is like, why does the academic affairs office hope to promote large courses? Assume that each department needs programming related courses or every department needs machine learning related courses do we have to open machine learning courses in every department separately or we just open a larger class let people from all departments take the courses this is the idea of why the office of academic affairs promote large scale courses okay if it is applied to image processing how is it if it is applied to image processing can we make Neurons of different receptive fields. Share parameters? That is parameter sharing, which shares parameters. What does parameter sharing mean? To be more specific here, the so called parameter sharing is that these two neurons and their weights are exactly the same. I especially use color to tell you that their weights are exactly the same. The first weight of this neuron above is called W1. The first weight of the neuron below is also W1. They are the same weights. I use yellow to indicate it here. The second weight of the neuron above is W2. The second weight of the neuron below is also W2. They are all indicated in yellow. And so on. The neuron at the top and the neuron at the bottom look after different receptive fields. But their parameters are exactly the same. Someone might ask. Since their parameters are exactly the same, will they always output the same? No. Why? Because their inputs are different. The parameters of these two neurons are indeed the same, but their scopes are different. The neuron above, we say its input is x1 x2. The neuron below, we say its input is x1 prime x2 prime. What are their outputs? The output of the neuron above is the product of x1 and w1 adding the product of x2 and w2. Sum them all and add a bias. Then get the output through the activation function. Although the neuron below also has w1 and w2. But w1 and w2 are multiplied by x1 prime and x2 prime. So its output won't be the same as the neuron above. Because the input is different. So even if two neurons share parameters their output will not be the same. Then you can infer that. You won't make two neurons serve exactly the same. Receptive field share parameters. Because if this happens, their output must always be the same. If the ranges of the two neurons are not the same, even if their parameters are the same, their output will not be the same. So this is the second simplification. We allow some neurons to share parameters. As for how to share, it can be decided by yourself. And this is something you can decide by yourself. But I still have to tell everyone. The common sharing methods on image recognition. And how is it set? We just talked about. Every receptive field. Has a group of neurons in charge of it. For example, if there's 64 neurons. The receptive field. Will also has 64 neurons. How do they share parameters with each other? We use the same color. To indicate that these two neurons share the same parameters. So in fact, every receptive field have only one set of parameters. That is, the first neuron of this receptive field will share parameter with the first neuron of this receptive field. Its second neuron shares parameters with its second neuron. Its third neuron shares parameters with its third neuron. So every receptive field has only one set of parameters. These parameters form a filter. So, these two neurons share the same set of parameters, which is called filter 1. Similarly, these two neurons share a set of parameters, 
which is called filter 2. Following the same logic, we have filter 3, filter 4, and so on. Okay, this is the second simplification method. We have already talked about two simplification methods. Let's briefly summarize it. This is the fully connected network, which is the most flexible. Then, we proposed that it's not necessary to look at the whole image. Looking at a small part of the image and detecting important patterns might suffice. Thus, we have the concept of the receptive field. When we force a neuron to only look at one small area in an image, it becomes less flexible. For a fully connected network, it can decide whether it wants to look at the whole image or only a small area. If it only wants to look at a small area, it can set most of the weights to be zero to achieve this. So the fully connected layer can decide by itself whether it wants to look at the whole image or only a small area. But, after introducing the concept of the receptive field, we no longer have a choice. We can now only see a small area of the image at once, which we think would be enough anyway. After we add the receptive field, the area we can look at gets smaller, making our network less flexible. What's next? Next, we talk about parameter sharing. Parameter sharing further limits the flexibility of the network. Originally, during the learning phase, it can decide the individual parameters of these two networks. Each neuron can have different parameters, no matter how similar or how different these parameters may be. But after adding parameter sharing, we force certain neurons to have parameters that are exactly the same. The freedom to learn different parameters is no longer there. This adds even more restrictions on the neurons. Combining receptive field and parameter sharing, we get a convolutional layer, which is what people often hear. Networks that use convolutional layers are called convolutional neural networks, or CNN for short. From this image, we can clearly see that CNN models have larger biases. It has a larger model bias. You might think that Having a larger model bias is a bad thing. Well, having a larger model bias is not necessarily a bad thing. When the model bias is small, the model is highly flexible, which could easily lead to overfitting. The fully connected layer can do all kinds of stuff. While it has various variants for various applications, it may not be suitable for every specific task. As for the convolutional layer, it was designed to deal with images. Receptive field and parameter sharing are designed to deal with images based on observations. Since the convolutional layer was designed to deal with images, its performance on image-related tasks is exceptional. Although the model has a large model bias, it is not a problem in image-related tasks. But, you might want to think twice. If you want to use it on other tasks, you have to consider whether those tasks and image-related tasks are similar in nature. Well, that was actually a certain way of introducing CNN. Now, we are going to talk about another way of introducing CNN. The second way of introducing CNN is exactly the same as the first way. It's the same story, told in different ways. You can decide which version you prefer. This second version is the more common way to explain CNN. The second version of the story and the first version of the story are exactly the same. So, if you didn't quite get it, when you listened to the first version, you can listen to the second version. Here starts the second version. What is a convolutional layer? Inside a convolutional layer are many different filters. These filters have the shape of 3 times 3 times the size of the channels. What is a channel? For a color image, we have three channels, which are RGB channels. For a black and white image, we only have one channel. What about the convolutional layer? Inside a convolutional layer is a row of filters. Each filter is a tensor with the shape of three times three times the size of the channel. The purpose of each filter is to capture a pattern in the image. Of course, these patterns need to have sizes within three times three times the size of the channel in order to be captured by these filters. How do these filters capture the patterns in the image? Let me give you an example. In the following example, 
we assume the channel count to be 1. In other words, the image is a black and white image. Then we assume that the parameters of these filters are known. Recall that a filter is a tensor. The values in this tensor are already known. In fact, the values of these tensor is the parameter in the model. The values in these filters are actually unknown. It will be found through training. Now we assume that the values in these filters have already been found. Let's take a look at how these filters do operation with a picture and how to detect patterns in a picture. Okay, this is our picture. It is a picture of size 6 by 6. Okay, so how do these filters interact with this picture to detect patterns? Below, we show the details. First, put the filter in the upper left corner of the picture. Then put all the values in the filter. There are 9 values here. Take these 9 values. Multiply the 9 values in this range in the upper left corner. That is to say, the 9 values in this filter will do the inner product with the 9 values in this range. How much is it? The result is 3. Okay, what about this filter? Originally, it is placed in the upper left corner. Then it is moved a little bit right. The moving distance is called stride. When I told the story of the first version, our stride is set to 2. The case in this version, our stride is set to 1. Okay. Move a little to the right. Then compute the inner product. Between this filter. And the values in this range. How much is it? Is it minus 1? Okay. This case is too simple. This is a very simple mathematics. Then. We move it a little bit to the right again. There is 1 here. There is 1 here. There is 1. Okay. Here minus 1. Minus 1. Minus 1. What is the result? Minus 3. And so on. Move a little to the right and count again. Then, after scanning all over here, just move down a little bit and count. And so on. Repeat it until the filter reaches in the lower right corner. What is the result here? Here 1 1 1 here minus 1, 1, minus 1. The answer is minus 1 and that's it. Anyway, how does this filter detect pattern? Well, in this filter, the values in the diagonal are all 1. So what kind of pattern? Or what thing in the image? will make the result of this filter the largest. When you see three ones in the image, its value will be the largest. So you will find that, in the output here, the upper left corner has the largest value. The value in the lower left corner is the largest one. That just tells us, that three appears in the upper left corner of this picture. This pattern appears in the upper left corner. Pattern of three ones connected together, appears in the lower left corner. This is the first filter. Okay, what's next? We tell each filter to repeat this process. For example, there is a second filter here. A filter is obviously detecting the situation when one is in a line. We start by placing the second filter to the upper left corner and get a value. Move a little to the right to get another value. Move a little to the right again to get another value. Repeat the same process. Repeat the same operation until the whole picture is scanned. We get another group of values. So every filter will give us a bunch of numbers. The red filter gives us a bunch of numbers. The blue filter gives us a bunch of numbers. If we have 64 filters, we get 64 groups of numbers. This group of numbers has another name. It's called feature map. So when we put a picture, through a convolutional layer, which contains a bunch of filters, we will produce a feature map. Suppose that in this convolutional layer, it has 64 filters. Then the feature map we generated has 64 sets of numbers. Each group is 4 by 4 in this example. Which means that the first filter produces 4 times 4 numbers. The second filter also produces 4 times 4 numbers. The third one also produces 4 times 4 numbers. And so on for all the 64 filters. So what is the meaning of the feature map? You can think of this feature map as another new picture. The difference is that the number of the channel of this picture is 64. Each channel corresponds to a filter. Originally, a picture has three channels. Through a convolution layer, it becomes a new picture that has 64 channels. Okay, this convolutional layer 
of course can be stacked multiple times. Here, I just stacked the first layer. What will happen if you add the second layer? In the second layer of convolution, there are also a bunch of filters. For each filter, we set its size to 3 by 3. For its height, it must be set to 64. Why? We know that the height of the filter is the channel of the image that it is processing. So with the first convolution layer, assume that the input image is black and white, and the channel is 1. Then the height of our filter is 1. If the input image is in color, and the channel is 3, then the height of the filter is 3. In the second layer, we will also get an image. For the second convolutional layer, its input is also an image. What is the channel of this image? The channel of this image is 64. Where does 64 come from? This 64 is from the number of the filter. From the previous convolutional layer. For the previous convolutional layer. If its filter number is 64. It has 64 channels in its outputs. So for the second layer. Assume that you want to use this image as input. The height of your filter should also equal to 64. Okay. So there is also a bunch of filters in the second layer. Only that the height of these filters are 64. Okay, the next question we want to answer is. If the size of our filter is always set to 3 times 3. Will our network be unable to look at a larger range of patterns? Actually, it won't. Because you think it this way. If we are in the second layer of the convolutional layer. And the size of our filters is the same as 3 times 3. What will happen? If we set up 3 times 3 filters as well. When we look at the value in the upper left corner. The value in the upper left corner corresponds to this range. On the image. The value in the lower right corner corresponds to this range. On the image. So when we look at the 3 times 3 range. And the output of the first convolutional layer. Of this feature map. Which is also 3 times 3 range. We actually consider a 5 by 5 range on the original image. So although our filter is only 3 times 3, the range of its consideration on the image is 5 times 5, which is bigger. So today, the deeper your network is, with the same size of 3 times 3 filters, the larger range it can see. So if the network is deep enough, you don't need to worry that you cannot detect larger patterns. It can still detect a large pattern. Okay, so far, we have just talked about two stories. The two versions of the story are exactly the same. In the first version of the story, we've mentioned that there are some neurons. These neurons will share parameters. These shared parameters are the filters in the second version of the story. Here we have 3 times 3 times 3 parameters in this set of parameters. There are 3 times 3 times 3 numbers in this filter. Here I deliberately use color to circle these numbers, so as to tell you that this weight is this number, this weight is this number, this weight may be this number, and so on. Here, I remove the bias. The neuron has a bias. Does this filter have a bias? Actually, it has. It's just not mentioned in the story. In the general implementation, the filters of your CNN still have the bias. Then in the first version of the story, we say that different neurons can share weight to cover different ranges. And for weight sharing, it's actually the filter scanning through an image. The filter scanning through an image is actually called convolution. This is why the convolutional layer is called the convolutional layer. Because the thing about the filter scanning through an image is actually convolution. The so-called filter scanning through an image is actually the different receptive field. The neurons can share parameters. And this set of shared parameters is called a filter. Okay, today we use two different aspects to tell you about CNN. I hope it can help you have a deeper understanding of CNN. Okay, so we say that. The reason to use CNN is based on two observations. The first observation is that we don't need to look at the whole image. For the first story version of the neuron, it's that. Neuron only looks at a small part of the image. For the filter story, it's that. We have a set of filters. Each filter only looks at a small range. It only detects small patterns. 
then we say the same pattern may appear in different places in the image. So neurons can share parameters. For the filter story, it's that. A filter must scan through the entire image. This is the convolutional layer. When a convolutional layer does image recognition, actually, there is a third commonly used thing called pooling. Where does pooling come from? Pooling comes from another observation. This observation is that we do subsampling on a larger image. For example, if you remove all even columns and all odd rows, the image will become one fourth of the original one, but it won't affect the content of the image. If we zoom in in a large image, this is a bird, and it still looks like a bird in the smaller image. So there is a design called pooling. How does pooling work? One thing about pooling is that it has no parameters. So it is not a layer. There are no weights in pooling. It has nothing to learn. So someone will say that pooling is more like an activation function. It's more like sigmoid and relu. Because there is nothing to learn in pooling. It is an operator whose behavior is fixed. There is no need to learn anything based on data for pooling. There are many different versions of pooling. We are talking about max pooling here. How does max pooling work? We just said that each filter generates a bunch of numbers. Each filter produces a bunch of numbers. When doing pooling, we just put these numbers in a few groups. In this example, we have two by two numbers in a group. We will choose a representative number from each group in max pooling. The representative number we choose is the maximum one. Then you may ask why you choose the maximum one. You don't necessarily have to choose the maximum one. This is what you can decide by yourself. In max pooling, we choose the maximum one. However, for example, there is also min pooling. We choose the minimum number for min pooling. I have also seen average pooling. So there are various methods of pooling. And do we have to group two by two numbers in a group? Not really. This one is also what you can decide by yourself. You can also do three by three, four by four, or whatever you want. Okay. So after a convolutional layer, usually it is followed by pooling. What pooling does is make the image smaller. After finishing the convolutional layers, we will obtain an image. There are many channels in this image. After doing pooling, we just leave the channel of this image unchanged. All 64 channels remain unchanged, but we will make the image a little narrower. In the previous example, a 4x4 image. If we group the value of output, into 2x2 two two values per group. The 4x4 four four image will become a 2x2 two two image. This is what pooling does. Generally, in practice, convolution and pooling are often used together. You may do convolutional layers several times and do pooling once. For example, two convolution layer and one pooling layer. That is, do convolution twice and pooling once. But you can observe that pooling can still do a little harm. To your performance. Suppose what you want to detect is a very subtle thing. Then if you just do subsampling, the performance may be slightly worse. So in recent years, you will find people often start to throw away pooling. In the network of image classification, they would do things like the fully convolutional network. It means the entire network contains only convolutional layers, but no pooling. That's because computing power has become much stronger in recent years. The main reason for pooling is to reduce the amount of computation. Do subsampling and reduce the size of images and the amount of computation. So if your computing resources are enough to support you, many network architecture designs often exclude pooling today. They will try the fully convolutional network, which includes only convolutional layers. Then see if the network can learn something and see if we can do better. But generally, your architecture will be convolutional layers plus pooling. But just like what I have said before, pooling is optional. Many people today may choose not to use pooling. Next, if you have passed through several convolutional layers, how do we get the final result in the end? You will do one thing with the output of pooling. It's called flatten. The word flatten was mentioned in homework too. By the teaching assistant, the so-called flatten means that in this image, Values that were originally arranged in a matrix form are straightened into a flat vector. Then we put this vector into the fully connected layer. You may have to do a softmax afterwards. 
And finally, we get the result of image classification. This is a classic image classification network. The network typically contains convolutional layers, pooling, flatten operation, and passing through a few more fully connected layers and softmax. And finally obtain the result of image classification. We will practice an image classification problem in homework 3. Okay, besides image recognition, you may have heard of CNN in the other most common and most familiar application. CNN can be used to play Go. Today, if I teach a machine learning class without mentioning AlphaGo, didn't everyone think that you had said nothing, right? So let's mention a little about AlphaGo. So how do you use this CNN to play Go? We say that playing Go is a classification problem. The input to your network is the position of black and white on the Go board. Your output is where the next step should be. But we already know that. The input of the network is a vector. How to represent the chessboard as a vector? No problem at all. There are 19 times 19 positions on the chessboard. Then we express a chessboard as a 19 times 19 dimensional vector. In this vector, if there is a black stone in a certain position, we fill in one for that position. If there is a white stone, we fill in minus one. If there is no black or white stone, we fill in zero. Then we can tell the network what does the game on the chessboard looks like now. We can use a 19 times 19 dimensional vector to describe a chessboard. Of course, it doesn't have to be done like this. It doesn't have to be one for a black stone and minus one for a white stone and zero for no stone. This is just a possible representation. You can think of other more mysterious expressions. In short, we have a way to describe the game on the chessboard with a vector. Feed the network with this vector. And then, you can treat Go as a classification problem. Call this network to predict where is the best place for the next step. So playing Go is a classification problem with 19 times 19 categories. The network will output which category is the best choice within these 19 times 19 categories. Where you should choose to place the next step can be solved completely by a fully connected network but the performance of using CNN is better. Why is it better to use CNN? First of all, you can view a chessboard as a picture. A chessboard can be seen as a picture with a resolution of 19 times 19. Generally, the picture resolution is much larger. Normal pictures with a resolution of 100 times 100 are considered small pictures, but the chessboard is a tiny picture. The resolution of this image is only 19 times 19. Every pixel in this picture represents a place on the board where you can place it. What about the channel? The channel of the general picture is RGB. RGB represents a color. Then what is every channel? On the Go board? In AlphaGo's original paper, it tells you that each position or pixel of the Go board is described with 48 channels. In other words, for every position on the board, use 48 numbers to describe what happened at that location. So why are these 48 numbers? This is obviously designed by a master of Go. Those 48 numbers include, for example, is this position going to be eaten? Or is there a different color stone next to this location, etc.? Each location is described like this. So you will use 48 numbers to describe a position on the Go board. The Go board is a 19 times 19 resolution picture. Its channel number is 48. Okay, but why can CNN be used to play Go? We just emphasized that CNN doesn't perform best in every case. It is designed for images. If a question doesn't have any characteristic in common with images, you shouldn't use CNN. Since you can use CNN to play Go, what does it imply? It means that Go and images have something in common. What are the common characteristics? We just said that the first observation on the image is that you only need to look at a small area to know the important patterns. Is this in common with Go? For example, you don't have to look at the whole Go board. You can know what happened here by only looking at this pattern. The white stone was surrounded by black ones. If the black stone plays here, then you can take the white stone away. The white stone will have to place here to not be taken away. In fact, the filter size of the first layer in AlphaGo is 5 times 5. 
So obviously the people who are designing this network suggest that. Looking at the range of 5 times 5 on the board. Can know many important patterns. Next, we said that the second observation on the image is. The same pattern that may appear in different positions. Is it the same in Go? This particular pattern. Can appear anywhere on the board. It can appear in the upper left corner. It can also appear in the lower right corner. From this point of view. Images have a lot in common with plain Go. But what makes people wonder is. When dealing with images, we often use pooling. Subsampling an image. Will not affect our interpretation of the objects in the image. But is the Go board like this? If you remove the odd numbered rows and even numbered columns on the board. Is it still the same game? It doesn't make sense. Playing Go is a delicate task. If you take out a column or a row. The whole game situation is different. It's impossible that removing a row and a column. Causes no issues. So some people said that. CNN has to have pooling. Pooling is used for image recognition. So AlphaGo must also have pooling. So it means AlphaGo sucks. One can attack the weakness of pooling. Then you can easily beat it. Is it really? AlphaGo is so strong. So obviously it does not have such obvious weakness. This question bothers me a bit. So I read through. The paper about AlphaGo. In fact, AlphaGo's paper on nature. Isn't very long. If I remember correctly. It only has 5 or 6 pages. So I also recommend you to go through the article. Interesting as it is. The network architecture isn't even mentioned. In the text. The details are only covered. In the appendix. So I read the appendix carefully. To understand AlphaGo's network architecture. Let's take a look. Here is how the network is described. In the appendix. First. Let's transform the Go board. Into an image of 19 times 19 times 48 size. I already told you that. We are seeing the chessboard as a picture. Next, the appendix says that they did zero padding. I also taught you this before. That is, if your filter exceeds the range of the image, add redundant zeros. Zero padding means adding zeros outside the range. The appendix also specified the filter size. The kernel size, or filter size, is 5 times 5. There are K filters. Here K is set to 192. Of course this is some experimental number. They also tried 128 and 256 and concluded that 192 is the best. All of the above belongs to the first layer. Then, stride equals 1. We have just explained what stride is. Then they applied rectifier nonlinearity. What is this? This is simply ReLU. This is just ReLU. From the second layer to the twelfth layer. All of the layers contain zero padding. All of those layers have the same kernel size 3 times 3. And the same number of filters. That is, each layer has 192 filters. For stride, it is still the same, which is 1. After stacking a lot of layers. They applied a softmax on the last layer. Because this is a classification problem. Okay, finished. Have you found anything strange? They didn't use pooling. That's the strange thing I am talking about. So this is a good example of the fact that. Designing neural networks doesn't always have a. Golden guiding principle. Don't think pooling is always good. Merely because we've used it a lot before. Pooling is not suitable for playing Go. So you have to think clearly. When you use a network architecture. You need to think about the meaning of this architecture. And determine whether the network is suitable for the current task. Back to CNN. In addition to playing Go and processing images. It has also been used in voice recognitions. And language processing recently. We won't go into details here. But if you want to use CNN to do voice recognition. And language processing. You must take a closer look at the methods in the literature. The design of receptive fields. And parameter sharing. Are very different. Between image processing. And speech processing. So you have to think clearly. The receptive fields which are used in speech are specially designed based on the characteristics of languages. So they are very different from those used in image processing. So don't think that the CNN for images works naively on other things. It may not work. You have to think clearly about the characteristics of voice and images to determine how you should design a suitable receptive field.
Okay, now I'm going to tell you a great weakness of CNN. CNN cannot handle image scaling and image rotations. How is that? Suppose you give a CNN lots of dogs with the same size. Surely it can recognize that this is a dog. When you zoom in this picture, can CNN still recognize it? Well, possibly not. You may think that this is very peculiar. Aren't the shapes exactly the same? Why can't CNN recognize it when the picture is zoomed in? Is CNN that stupid? Sadly, it is. Even though two pictures have exactly the same shape, the values are totally different. If you transform them into vectors, therefore CNN can't handle this problem. Although you can easily see that the two pictures are the same. It's very different for the perspective of the network. So actually, CNN can't handle image scaling and image rotations. Suppose it has learned to recognize some similar objects of a small size. Then it will most likely fail if you zoom in the objects. So CNN is not as powerful as you think. That's why we often need to do data augmentation in image recognition. To do data augmentation, you can pick some parts of the images out and enlarge them or add random rotations as well. So your CNN is familiar to different sizes and different angles of the same object. This way, you can achieve better results with CNN. Then you might ask, if CNN can't handle scaling and rotations, does there exist any network architecture which can deal with this problem? Actually, yes, there is an architecture called Special Transformer Layer. We won't talk about it. So I put the link of this video here for your reference.